So first of all, I want to kind of remind everybody that our water supplies are dynamic. We don't need to get complacent about just trusting that our water supply is always okay. You know, it's, our water supplies can change from season to season, influenced by droughts and flooding. I always like to remind people about the story when Hurricane Katrina came through. Down in southern Mississippi, we had some growers that started having a lot of trouble with E. coli. They've never had it before. Well, they got contamination in their wells. They got the E. coli. So it took some extra effort on their behalf to get their water supplies cleaned up. It's influenced by agriculture, industry, septic systems. We can get some septic system failures, contaminating water supplies. Influenced by well depth, placement, rocks, soil it passes through. Usage level. We certainly see that in the summer when we increase our water usage, we start seeing some minerals getting concentrated in those supplies. And that's going to kind of change the dynamics of water supplies. Surface water supplies are certainly the most vulnerable. This was a lesson learned not too many years ago, and there was a, a breeder farm, a broiler breeder farm, that when they went to market, they tested positive for low path avian influenza. Turns out that they were pulling their water supply from a pond. Wildfowl had been hanging out in that pond, and it's just kind of a natural link that that's where the contamination came from. Contaminants are both good and bad. There's no such thing as pure water supplies. Water has to have things dissolved in it. A little bit of calcium, magnesium in your water is a good thing. When we start having a little bit of iron and manganese, then maybe that can create some problems for us. So we're going to have things can in, dissolved in the water. A little bit of some things is okay. A little bit of other things maybe not so good for us. Top of the list, what factors impact our water quality? Microbes, bacteria, fungus, mold. We're really starting to get our hands around seeing mold in water supplies and seeing a direct link to fee conversion, health issues in flocks. Biofilm, I'm going to talk about that because I think that's the one factor that we really haven't created a good understanding of and what it can have what impact it can have flock after flock. Touch a little on pH, mineral content, water sanitation between flocks during flocks. So the biofilm. I used to think, you know, I would say poor white line water sanitation leads to biofilm. That's not true anymore. We have farms, they're doing great water sanitation and they have a biofilm in their systems. I think biofilms are just very tough, very durable. They get established. We have a chink in our armor regarding our water sanitation program. We've got to run vaccines, something going on. That biofilm gets established. And once it's there, it's like this wall. It creates a protective coating, and it can hide behind that protective coating, the microorganisms. There's actually sentinels, just like a castle. They're watching. There's chlorine in the water. OK, stay behind the wall. Oops, there's no chlorine today. Oh, man, they've got vitamins in the water. Open the gate. Let's get out there and harvest the nutrients. So biofilms are very, you know, they, they have a very great ability to survive. And they can harbor diseases like E. coli, Bordetella, Salmonella, you name it. There's all kinds of things that can be harbored in there. And once it's established, the rules for cleaning that system are changed. It can be up to a thousand times harder to clean that system to actually remove that biofilm than if it were a clean system. And then if we don't do a good enough job getting everything out of the system, within two to three days, it's as if we didn't do anything at all. It can be right back where it was. What influences the biofilm? Well, natural contaminants. I think these three right here are real key culprits, iron, manganese, sulfur. Then when we, every time we use things like vitamins, electrolytes, organic acids, Kool-Aid, Jell-O, sugar water, people feel compelled sometimes to give birds a little bit of um, sugar in the water, vaccines, vaccine stabilizers, some of the worst water I've ever cultured had vaccine stabilizers, milk replacer in it. That was just a fabulous food supply for the ba bacteria. 
Do we clean the lines after we use products? What do we do if we have to run something on our birds? Do we boost our water sanitation after we do it, or is it business as usual, or do we put anything in it? And what I always like to challenge people, no matter what industry they're in, how often do we wa sacrifice our water sanitation program so that we can use a water system as a, as a way to deliver products to our birds? In fact, I kind of came up with a brilliant idea. You know, if we could come up with little nuggets of vitamin electrolytes that we could put out, you know, in like we were putting out grit versus always putting these things in our water, how much better off we would be as an industry if we could get away from putting these things in our water. I always like to remind people, how do you put things in your water? Does this look like, you know, your medicator rooms? Very clean, sanitary, the only thing that has access to the contents of that bucket is the medicator hose? Or is this, you know, the way Sometimes we get a little sloppy. Uh, you know, they're, they, you know, it doesn't really matter. This is a nice little one. There's a little dead mouse floating in their vita, you know, vitamin bucket. Boy, that should add a real nice ambiance to it. But we just have the opportunity for open buckets, buckets sitting in the barns, to add a lot of airborne particulate microbes, whatever, into that container. And then now we're feeding it in to the water supply. So we have to be cautious about how we actually add things. How we store and handle water. A lot of folks in our area, they like these clear above ground storage tanks. It's cheap and you can put, you know, hold your water in it. And we found that they become a reservoir for algae growth. And then that just starts hammering your performance. You can, in, once the algae gets established in there, you can never get ahead of it as far as water sanitation because it's going to pretty much neutralize the chlorine along with the sunlight, and you're never going to be able to get ahead and make sure you're giving those birds clean, sanitized water. Sagging water lines, I know that's not a concern for you guys, but when you have systems like this, you're never going to have a good thorough cleaning of that system. You're going to have peaks and valleys in your cleaning process. And I don't care how well you sanitize the barn, if you're not cleaning this reservoir of potential disease organisms, then you've left a huge part of the job undone. I used to be a big fan of water samples. You know, if, let's see, you know, how much bacteria is in your water, and then that'll be a baseline for what we ought to do to clean your system up. And it's still a decent tool. You know, these are some, this was a community water supply where we're from. They don't have to have backflow preventers. So if you have a loss of pressure in that system, you can get contamination back into your system. And so for this guy, there was a little bit of contamination out there. End of the line, he had 2.3 million colony-forming units of bacteria. That's a hard load for a day-old bird to overcome. This guy had great water, but just didn't take care of it. Again, you get a lot of microbial contamination in that water supply. It's difficult for a young bird to overcome that challenge. But then, we've had a friend of mine who's working with some farms up in the Midwest, and they were taking water samples, not seeing anything, but he started swabbing. And he was swabbing sandpipes, nipple drinkers, and he was finding things like Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, Chryseobacterium, all the same organisms they were finding in the sick poults when they took them to the lab. The water system was just sitting there as a reservoir for these contaminants, and, you know, without going in and actually disturbing that biofilm, without going in and knocking the wall down and scooping up what was behind it, you may or may not capture that contamination if you go in and just take a drip sample. So I so, said, okay, let's take this a step further. So we started doing some water sampling on our farm. I, you know, I'm the water lady, so by golly, I'd like to think we're doing it right on our farm. We're running gas chlorination, acidification, monitoring, things are good. So my assistant, Mary, she came up with these little sterile sponges and she'd sterilize her little forceps 
and then she'd clean the end of the water line with, we use like 91% alcohol. It's not very many people want me to flame their plastic spigots. So we'll clean it really good and then put the sponge in and then turn it really good. This is in a pulp barn. These aren't our water lines, but in a pulp barn. So stick it in about eight to 10 inches, swab it really good, turn it to pick up that stuff. And we started doing this on our farm. We saw that we were having about two to four colony forming units when we took the drip sample. We were having 270,000 colony forming units when we looked at the swab. So even with our good water sanitation program, that biofilm was very hardy in there. So she took this out to some farms. And this was a farm one had regular cleaning schedule, sanitizing between the flocks but didn't leave the sanitizer very long, but used the right concentration. Farm two, they sanitized the main overhead lines, but they weren't actually sanitizing the lines going down into the drinkers, plassons and the drinker lines. And then there was a farm that sanitized properly twice a year, whether they needed it or not. And they were all using some form of water sanitation with the birds present. And these were all turkey farms, poultry. We also went on to two commercial farms, and this was continuously using chlorine-based water treatment program with the birds present. And this farm flushed and sanitized after every other flock, following the manufacturer's directions for product use. Remember that thought, every other flock, not every flock. Evaluated samples over five flocks, came in behind the flocks and then swabbed and pulled drip. And then pulled samples from different lines. So. That way, if you've swabbed this line, you've kind of basically changed what might be there. So then we need to swab another line. Each of these barns has eight lines, so that's easy enough to do. And then this was a farm that was using chlorine, but not real consistent. And they were having a lot of performance issues, just not doing well at all. And these were both broiler farms. And in this farm, we said, hey, let's look at yeast and mold, too. That's kind of when we started looking there. So for the turkey guys, when we were looking at the drips, not much there, little bit in the swab, quite a bit in the drip, 2.9 million CFUs we were picking up on the swabs. This guy, 2,100 CFUs in the drip sample, 63,000 colony forming units per milliliter in the swab. So right there, we're already seeing a significant difference in what we're picking up. Now this was the farm, the broiler farm, that was doing a great job with their water sanitation. So if you came in and looked at their drip samples, you'd say, man, these guys are on top of it. Look how much we were picking up. And then where's the dip? And then it goes back up and a dip, and then it goes back up. Well, again, they were clean. They would swab, they would clean. The, you know, for the next flock, the counts would remain low, but they weren't cleaning again, so the count started steadily going back up. And this is in the presence of chlorine always being there. And then again, cleaned again, went down, and it went back up. So how is this biofilm able to overcome chlorine in there and reestablish? This was the broiler farm that was having struggling. Look how much contamination we were seeing. We're still seeing some in their water, but quite a bit in the swabs. And then when we looked at mold, and this is where I think mold probably has a bigger factor in our water systems and impairing our bird performance. Crop mold, if you will, things like that. And quite a bit of mold. So on this farm, they came in and started running ProxyClean. It made a big difference. So what are the keys for water success with water quality? Well, I think a really good water sanitation program. The biofilm's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult to overcome. So we just have to keep the pressure on in order to overcome it. Because Farm A, even though they had the biofilm, because they kept their water sanitation pressure on, they had good performance. So we need to clean our water systems, but what does that entail? What does it mean to clean a water system right? Well, that was kind of a lesson learned for us. One day we were working with an operation, and we came in and we charged one water line, and this was with no birds present, with an acid, PWT, sodium bisulfate. It says on the package you can clean lines. That must mean it works. 
And then we came over to another line in that barn and we changed, clean, put it in 3% ProxyClean, charged it. ProxyClean is a 50% stabilized hydrogen peroxide. We let that sit for 24 hours and then we came back the next day and we started flushing the water out. When we looked at this water, most of us would say, hey, the system's clean, we've got everything out, life is good. The reality of it was the systems were very dirty. We just weren't using the right thing to get it out. Again, we're back to that wall. That acid whistled past that protective wall, but it took the proxy clean to bust the wall down to rip out all of that biofilm colony in there and start getting it out. But we also know that we can't just put anything in our water systems. We, um, I worked with a producer who got really frustrated with the respiratory challenges he was having on his farm. And so Alfred called me up and he said, you know, I, I think I've messed up. He said, I just got mad and I poured straight bleach in and started, he flushed in my lines. And next thing you know, Alfred is changing out a lot of diaphragms in his regulators because he just basically destroyed them. So what are our best choices? So I always like to tell this story. I was out cleaning the cow trough one day, trying to get the algae out. I was like, man, no matter how hard I clean this, it always comes back. And I thought, you know what? This stuff's pretty hardy. Let's use it as a test model. So I took my little beakers with the algae water in it. And I said, all right, let's just see. 3% bleach, pretty stout stuff. And then this is a 34% hydrogen peroxide stabilized. And I did a 1%, and that would be about like using the medicator. Running it at a 1 to 128 is a 0.78% solution. And then we did a 2 and a 3. We had a lot of bacteria in that water starting out. About a million colony forming units. We put the products in. We came back four hours later. Bleach still had about 1,000 colony forming units. 24 hours later, about 1,000 colony forming units left. 3% bleach. It's really not the best product for removing, destroying a biofilm, but yet it can be very harsh on your equipment. So it's really not the best choice. The hydroline at the somewhat medicator rate, it left quite a bit of stuff behind. And I think as an industry, that's where we've kind of dropped the ball we don't have a way to, to inject something stronger than a 1% solution. We use our medicators. We've just dropped the hose in there. We think we've done a good job, but not necessarily. We really need to get up to these 2 3% solutions in order to do a good job. And we saw the same thing with ProxyClean. I kind of think ProxyClean is the gold standard as far as doing a good job of you know, the products that we can use right now. Even the medicator rate of ProxyClean wasn't enough. We left stuff behind. If we leave stuff behind, then it's as if we really, you know, we're playing a numbers game. We've reduced, but we haven't fixed our problem. So proper line cleaning really requires the right concentrations, 2 3%. I've got some folks that have even run ProxyClean at 4 and 5% because they only had a one shot to make a difference. They've told me it looks like sewer water coming out of their lines. This is called a quick mix pump. There's an easy mix. These guys mix right. Sometimes, you know, people have had good luck with them. Sometimes not, but they are about 50, 60 bucks. So it might be worth a try if you want to do something fairly quick, but you can hook it in like a medicator, drop your hose in, and then get a better concentration. Or I think I'm still a big fan of just submersible or a transfer pump. You know when it pumps, it's pumping, you know, exactly what you've mixed up. And what we'll do is we'll mix up in a trash can our 3% solution. So 30-gallon trash can, 29 gallons of water, 1 gallon of ProxyClean. There's your 3% solution. And then just hook that transfer pump in where the medicator hooks in, and then you can, and then you can um, charge your line. One thing where we miss the boat, we'll clean the houses, but we don't necessarily clean the lines coming from the well house to the barns. And I've had some folks who, until they cleaned that part of the system, they didn't get rid of their problems. So 
The more you can completely clean the system, the better you're going to be at controlling issues. I also like to remind people that you need to get, when you line clean, you've got to get that product down into the little drinkers. Because if you just clean the line and that product, and you don't activate that drinker and get it down in there, we've actually found Bordetella down in the little drinker well. And the birds will drink, they're sick, and that microorganism just kind of wicks up and sits in there. So you've got to make sure you clean all parts of the cistern to have the most effectiveness. But I also need to point out that, again, even on, you know, the far May, we knock the numbers down, but it's not a miracle cure. This was a farm that was having a lot of health issues, challenges, and they had quite a bit of bacteria in their system. They did the 3% proxy clean, but then 48 hours, they flushed it out. There was still a lot. So I think what happens is when we have a very built-up concentration of crud in our system, the proxy clean is going to work the best it can. It's going to start ripping out the wall. But sometimes when it rips the wall, it starts displacing things. And so now we've disturbed that biofilm, and now it gets dumped out. And if it doesn't all get killed, it can become a source of contamination for our birds. So the critical thing in line cleaning is make double darn sure that the last water coming in has a sanitizer level that's okay for the birds to drink. Give this a chance to knock out all this stuff that's kind of been displaced when we clean that line. And in that way, we've made sure that we finish the job. So bottom line, biofilms are a very real challenge. They are very tough. They're durable. They can live on nutrient levels we can't even detect. Don't give it a chance because once it gets established and then the bad stuff moves in, then it can haunt you over and over again because you don't know which day it's going to decide to release and go to your birds. pH effective on water quality, you know, pH is just a measure of how acidic basic. Change of one is a tenfold change in the pH. So four is ten times more acidic than a pH of five. Nine is ten times more basic than a pH of eight. pHs of 6.5, it's corrosive if we have metal pipes, metal fittings. It will eat it up. And particularly if it gets below five you, or below six, you're going to see some corrosion in your metal. PVC pipe, not quite as sensitive to it. Used to think a pH of less than 4.9, we'd had four, poor performance. I think it has more to do with the acid. I think our birds can be very tolerant of different acids, and I think we need to just try different acids to find out what's compatible with your water, what do the birds like. But I don't necessarily think it's critical to get it below 5.9. pH of 8, worst thing it does for us is it reduces the efficacy of chlorine when we're using it. Really want to see a pH range of 4 to 7 if we're using chlorine as our sanitizer. So again, what happens when we put bleach into water? It wants to be one of two things, either an acid or a chloric ion. When the pH is low, this 4 to 7 range, the acid form dominates in the water. When we have pHs of 7 and a half, 8, 9, the ion form dominates. The reason we're concerned about that the acid form is 80 to 300 times more effective as a sanitizer. That's the one that if you've got two parts per million of chlorine and the pH is adjusted so it's mostly hypochlorous acid, hey, if that sick bird comes over and drinks in that water, you might have that 10 second or less kill time. So he's not contaminating the water supply and passing it on to all the other birds. So if you're using chlorine as your sanitizer, use a second injector lower your pH below 7, and get a significant boost in your water sanitation. There's also some thought out there that lowering the pH is actually effective for some microbial control. Dr. Roney, when he was in Alabama, did some tests, and they found that if they could kick the pH down to 4, that was a very hostile environment for E. coli, Salmonella, Clostridium. In these ranges, they were still thriving, particularly Clostridium. 
So pH adjustment alone isn't always enough. We really almost have to have the combination to, to get the, the full benefit because not very many people are going to run it this slow. And I don't really think the birds want to have it for very long, but we can do some short-term shock pH down. And then I've had folks will tell me that they see the, tight, the droppings tighten back up on their birds. We know that we can't run bleach and chlorine in the same stock solution. I had a grower that did it, and she said this green cloud chased her out of her medicator room. But we can do side-by-side -side injections, you know, with stinner pumps or dositrons, do side-by-side. -side. This was kind of, a, and this kind of hit home just a couple of weeks ago. Dry products definitely mix better in warm water. We put in PWT, sodium bisulfate, it's a powder. This was in cold water. This was in warm water. We got a nice blue color here. We have a uniform stock solution. The cold water it probably took hours, if ever, that we had a uniform stock solution. And I'm going to touch on this again in a minute because I was working with an operation and they were using chlorine dioxide and they were trying to use a powder acidifier and it wasn't working. So I'm going to follow up on that in a second. Challenges with chlorine. We are wearing it out. We've used and abused bleach to the point that things are building resistance to it. And this is a really good case of that. This was a turkey company that had a lot of challenges. So they went to wholehearted, across the complex, 120 farms, gas chlorination, acidification, made a big difference in the overall health performances of their operation, except for one area of producers. And all these guys kind of got their farms built around the same time under the same building coordinator. And really the common denominator were concrete water holding tanks. I think there were about five to 10,000 gallon underground tanks. You know, they had all kinds of sources, well, rural, whatever. But these guys were having consistent E. coli outbreaks around three weeks of age. And they were having to medicate their way out of it. And it was ugly. And they were going to market with these 20-week-old toms with about 80% livability, and it, it was not, not working well. Well, I started looking at the situation. I said, you know what? This gas chlorine and acidification, as good as it is, when those birds are little and they're not moving that water, that residual's not hanging around. Particularly when those lines are warm and slow, the chlorine's gone, and that was giving the E. coli an opportunity to pop in there and cause problems. And in these concrete tanks with the algae, there was a biofilm built up. I don't care how hard they were, they, were, they would drain these tanks and power wash them, but concrete has a lot of crevices for stuff to hide in, so they couldn't completely get rid of it. <coughs> Chlorine wasn't holding its residual because of that slow, warm, moving water. So they went to ProxyClean. 30 mils per liter, four ounces per gallon was their stop. Started running it with the medicator, 1 to 128. Started running this proxy clean during brood. Took care of the E. coli. It completely knocked out their E. coli. Flock started settling 90% or best livability. And in fact, the veterinarian told me not too long ago, he said, you know, we are finding Bordetella that's, that's chlorine resistant. We've got farms. We never take them off proxy clean anymore. So what we've kind of learned from this lesson is, is, you know, water sanitation We've kind of been sloppy with it over the years, and it's really getting to be like a coccidiostat control program. We probably need to be looking at some different options, altering it in or rotating them into our program in order to prevent some resistance showing up that's going to come back and really hit us with a vengeance. Hydrogen peroxide. There's a lot of folks that have started using it. They're having great luck. A lot of the broiler guys have kind of flipped to it in our area, have rolled off bleach, and they're having some good results with it. If you use it, you want to have about 25 to 50 ppms of residual in your drinking water. You can get some little strips so you can test it. It is good for, you know, sanitizing pond, river water. You don't get the byproducts and the off taste that you get if you're chlorinating those sources of water. Got to be careful using your proxy, you know, your proxy clean hydrogen peroxides. They are, you know, flammable, can be dangerous to store. So got to be careful how you do it. 
effectiveness of just non-stabilized progen peroxides will deteriorate over time. So the stabilized ones hold up better, like ProxyClean. They last longer in the stock solution. We just did a little test. This is kind of how I came up with the four ounces per gallon. It had a nice at 25 ppms, held fairly well. You know, five days, not so good. But if you can get residual two, three days out of a stock solution in your water lines, I think we're ahead of the game, particularly when they're little and they're not moving the water themselves. We've done the six. That really pushes it up there. Six ounces per gallon stock, one to 128 over time. The birds didn't like it. So there is kind of a fine line between what's enough and what's too much. And we found that the four ounce went in our test barns where we got a lot of microbial contamination showing up, get a lot going on, but with the four ounce, we're keeping it under control. Six really knocked it down. So if you had to maybe follow behind some vaccinations or vitamins or something, you might get hit them with a six ounce per gallon for a day to just kind of get things knocked back down. Hydroline did all right, six ounces, Hydroline. Sid did a good job, particularly at the four ounces per gallon. It's got the parasitic acid, and there's some folks that have actually had luck controlling things like dermatitis with it. Birds have a slight snick. This time of year, warm days, cool nights, they get a little respiratory challenge. We like to run iodine as an expectorant, we'll do organic iodine. And should you stop chlorinating? Absolutely not. Chlorine, iodine work very well together. And we just use this iodine. It comes in little packets. And, you know, you can run the um, iodine with a second pump. You might not get a good chlorine reading when running both, but don't worry about it. They're very synergistic. And I actually found out this week there's a, a guy who's um, running ProxyClean and chlorine on top of it. And he told me, he said, hey, with the ProxyClean in the water, I'm actually getting better chlorine residual readings. So that was something that I had not thought would work because of the stabilizers in it. So that's something to think about. What mixes base products? If you're using sulfa drugs, penicillin, you kind of need to tip the pH up a little bit. You might want to add ammonia, sodium hydroxide. That's going to make these more soluble and that's going to make it go to your birds better. Acidic products, Tetracycline, citric acid are very synergistic. Erythromycin, vitamins, and proleum tend to like the more acidic. So you might want to, you know, if you want to get the most value out of those, you're going to want to kind of adjust your pH down. And then high D, this is a good vitamin soluble, high, vitamin D soluble product. There was some um, thought that it worked well with the PWT, but not citric. So that's kind of something we need to think about. Optimizing chlorine dioxide. This is a company that's saying, hey, you know, we're not getting the benefits out of bleach. We want to look at a third part thing. So they went to anthium dioxide, and that is a 5% chlorine dioxide, but really sodium chloride product. And they were using it, and they were still, you know, things were okay, but they were still getting titers for some disease challenges in their birds. And they're like, eh, you know, we're not, don't have it under control. They started injecting a powder acid like the PWT, mixing it up. Things still weren't working well. They went to a liquid acid. This is a sodium uh, calcium bisulfate product. Fresh flow, it's a liquid. And what they did, this was really kind of an interesting deal. They came in with two stinner pumps. This is not a cheap setup, but because you have to have a flow sensor and you had the two stinner pumps. One was pumping in the anthium. One was pumping in the fresh flow. Let's see if it's here. And then they made this little mixing chamber. So here's your acid. Here's your chlorine dioxide. They're injecting into this mixing chamber. The acid is working with that anthium, creating a very active chlorine dioxide. And then there's just a little pressure button in here. So as this chamber fills, it's kicking into the water supply. With the liquid acid, they're getting a very, and with the liquid acid, it's taking less. And what they found that the stinner pumps were running in unison versus when they were using the powder acid, it was running a whole bunch and the chlorine dioxide would run once. So they were having a real skewed level 
of sanitizer acid in the little mixing chamber and it was just all over the place. By having a stronger liquid acid that's a good uniform acid and the chlorine dioxide, as they went in, they went in together at the same rate, they're coming into the water and they have really hit a home run with this project on their farms. They're, they're knocking out their disease titers and the birds are doing very well. So if you've got a problem farm, it's not a cheap setup to set up like that, but once they got it set up, it's fairly easy to use because the stinner pumps don't require much maintenance and it's been a real boon for them. And then so when they were out here on these plassons looking at their levels, he had great chlorine dioxide residual. So done. And these birds were doing very, very well and they had a sister barn that was still on the chlorine dioxide dry or powder acid mix and they were having a lot of health challenges because they didn't have good uniform residual there. So it's really critical to think about how am I going to optimize good sanitizing residual to my birds to assure I control those disease. A couple of things I want to just point out. You know, houses on the same farm, three were outweighing, you know, houses outweighing two of the houses. Management same, no health issues, no apparent differences in the houses, everything was the same. But what they found out, the water pressure. Nobody had been paying attention to the water pressure. On the good performing houses, 25, 30 PSI. Poor performing houses, 10 PSI. They didn't have enough water pressure to meet the water demand for the birds. So, of course, if there's not enough water, man, the key point you can tell if you don't have enough water, there's a water restriction. You have great looking birds, no, you know, no mortality issues, just poor weight, poor feed conversion. This is another one we need to be paying attention to. This little metal regulator that we use to crank down the pressure coming into the houses, it has a screen in front of it. We're seeing a lot of sediment, and actually on high sulfur water farms, it's got all this sulfur algae that's clogging that screen. We're getting the same issue there, water restriction. So, you know, pay attention to that screen. Don't let it clog up and create a water restriction problem for your birds. And this is kind of my last one. You see this? You, at first it looks like bubbles, but actually it's the inside of this pipe flaking off. And this was a guy called in a panic. What's going on? This is my water line. What's happened? Well, black polyvinyl pipe. He started using an acid blend with phosphoric acid. You start using sulfuric phosphoric, those are some pretty stout acids. That pipe wasn't rated for those acids. It was eating it up. Saw the same exact thing on water, just water hoses that were dropping out of the overhead line into the, the lines in the barns. They were running an acid, that hose, they'd skimp and gotten a cheaper hose. It ate the lining out of that hose and it and it just got into the water system and caused the drinkers to clog open. And the birds, when they went to market, I think were standing in about three inches of water. So if we're going to use products, make sure the system is rated for those products, your hoses, your water lines, because if it's not, it could create a lot bigger problems than um, you were <coughs> wanting. So kind of lessons learned with water. It's a very important nutrient. There's no doubt about it. If we don't have good water supply to our, our birds, we're going to probably have some challenges. But it can be complex to understand, solve issues, but with a little bit of help, you know, you can get it figured out. Might cost you a little money sometimes to do a good treatment, but most of the time it's worth it. Here's the part where we, we kind of drop the ball. Our water programs need to be managed all the time, even when the barns are empty. I think that's when our biofilm becomes established. Keep our water program simple. More is not always better. You know, do we just get into habits of running things? I have a new farm manager right now, and boy, he's just wanting to run this and run that. And we're saying, okay, I'm going to let you do it this, this time, but then we're going to rethink. And, I, and I'm already seeing the trend that running all these things, not having just good, clean, sanitized water is not making life better for the farm. So we'll let him figure it out, and then we're going to go back to just Good sanitized water. More not always better with water treatments. The birds will tell you if your water program is right. Be the guinea pig. Taste the water. I'll go, there's not too many farms that I won't taste the, I'll at least put it in my mouth. I may not swallow it, but I will at least taste it. Because 
That's your cash crop is drinking it. If you're not going willing to drink it, why are we asking our cash crop to drink it? We need to do it. Test your water supplies twice yearly, hot and cold season. Get a good baseline. What's changing in this water supply? Use swabs to check weak points in your system. You could find some really good eye-opening clues about your water supplies by swabbing it.